I want to commend you for your commitment to lifelong learning by not only putting on this conference, and congratulations to the uh, people who organized it, but also to you uh, who continue to come to improve your, your thought processes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the interaction of various disciplines, and this is conflict management time, uh, going to charm school. I recognize that most of you in this room are extremely biased, prejudiced, opinionated bastards. <laughs> and we'll go to that heart of danger and approach it. I bring you greetings from the Texas Medical Center, uh, which is a 1,300-acre uh, conglomerate of healthcare facilities with the world's largest concentration of mass raw ego, most of it in the surgeons. We interact with a number of individuals, and these individuals in this fast-paced environment have to be integrated. And with a new language of accountable care and integrated collaborative networks, it's important that we get a handle on this and at least admit that we have to approach conflict uh, resolution. It is in the emergency center, the trauma room, where we all uh, uh, sort of come together. And all of these disciplines on this slide are the ones that fight in this uh, turf. I show you a slide and um, I would ask uh, you uh, to read it. I, uh, let's see, uh, the gentleman in the second row, can, can, can you just stand up quickly and, and read this uh, slide for me? Okay, oh, I'm sorry. All right, sit down. It's my observation that his angle was bad. Um, and uh, coming and sitting down, sir, uh, uh, Peter, can, can you read this for me? No. Okay. Uh, who, the, the gentleman next to you. Now, he read it quietly. Maybe somebody in the back of the room. The lady who just drank coffee in the third from the back. Can you stand up? Uh, rather than waste my time, sit down. <laughs> Let me read this to you. It's obvious you all came into this room prejudged. This says, a bird in the, the hand. Oh, birds of a, a feather, deep in the, the heart of Texas. What we've established is that you came in with an opinion and you thought you wanted, I wanted you to read it the way you read it, and you didn't even pay attention to detail. I hope you take care of patients better than you read English. <laughs> I do have one disclosure to declare that I did not give to the people ahead of time, and that is that I have a competing conference, and uh, I guess that may be a conflict of interest. Probably not. The EMS, EMT, trauma, acute care surgery, and others interact at a number of levels. And whether it be uh, resuscitation, uh, whether it be uh, ultrasound, uh, I think ultrasound's an instrument of the devil, except for hemopericardium, and is massively overused. The trauma lab panels, we all have different views. EMS has certain views of life listed on this uh, slide with tremendous variability from city to city and EMS agency to EMS agency. Emergency medicine started in 1970, uh, has uh, individuals with different kinds of genomes than those of surgeons. I'll have more to say th about that later. Acute care surgery is what general surgery used to be and uh, is, a, is a nocturnal uh, animal that takes care of what no one else wants to take care of. Critical care, five specialties have an interest. They have the same questions and the same answers on their uh, examinations. The correct answers are different depending on the specialty. I've always found that uh, fascinating. And disaster management plays into this. So these areas come together in the Tower of Babel with definitions that say different things uh, to each of them. 
So the interactions among these uh, uh, are what I'm talking about today. I would ask you on the next slide to look at the block underneath the uh, title. There's no tricks. I'd ask you to count the number of Fs in this slide. And da da pom So I give you time to read. Some of you are slow readers. You've had time. I'd ask you to vote. How many of you saw two Fs? Three? Four? Five? Six, seven, eight, nine. Well, it appears to me there are different numbers in the room, and because of that, I would ask you, do you want to see this, the, the phrase again? We've already polled the audience, and I'll remove 50% of the uh, incorrect uh, 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 answer. So here it is. Dum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum. You've seen it before, so let's vote. How many of you say three? Those that said three stuck to your guns. How many say four? Five. Six. The correct answer is six. You didn't believe me. Here it is. Oh! You know, you knew this was coming because of the bird in the hand. You still missed it. You missed it because you're prejudiced. You're biased. And you don't want to accept what anyone else says. I've shown these two examples to prove to you that you need to disengage your mind and come with me on the next issue about focus, concentration, values, and uh, background. A few words about trauma codes and classification. Uh, there are levels of severity. What we're talking about is the big bad injury, and indeed uh, that accounts for only 4% of those 4,000 people that come into Ryder or to my hospital or to your hospital. The majority of people that are injured do not need any resuscitation, probably don't need any intervention whatsoever. We need to admit that. Over 70% of patients uh, that are carried by helicopter across the United States get a bill for twenty dollars to $30,000, but are dismissed within 18 hours because they have no injury or minor injury um, and uh, didn't need that expensive hospital gown. A word about trauma centers. There is no quality difference between a level uh, one and a three trauma center. There are other trauma centers, but we're really talking about the trauma centers that we work in. It, there is an issue of commitment, operative sites, communication, and transfer capabilities, and the patient belongs to the surgeon from the second they arrive. The third are overriding governing principles. Each of us will be a patient. Patients are taken care of by doctors, Consultants give an opinion. They don't write on the damn chart. The various people order char uh, tests. It ought to be the patient's doctor, and there can be standardized outcome. Collaborative practice and co-management is a bunch of BS and ought to disappear from our vernaculum. One person is in charge. Co-management leads to mediocrity. I guarantee you. Tests are based upon knowledge of anatomy and how it will affect our decision making. 95% of the tests, x-rays, images, CTs, lab, ordered in the emergency department, in the ambulance, often in the ICU, do not alter decision making. It's mental masturbation to satisfy the hospital administrator to sell the patient something so that they can make money. There are turf questions, and I'll spend a lot of time, uh, uh, the rest of my time, on turf issues among these disciplines because we look at things differently and we need to admit that we are part of this conflict resolution and if we're to be a, co a conflict uh, uh, coach, we need to realize a lot of it starts with us. And these individuals work together. We live in our silos. You know what a silo is. A silo is a tall, imposing structure windowless, buried in the weeds. Those weeds have rattlesnakes, 
wreck crocodiles, scorpions, spiders, and to get from one silo to another, you have to crawl through these weeds. It's top-down management. We know that doesn't work, and they are isolated and disconnected. They can explode. They often do explode, and you don't know what's inside. There are various silos uh, that relate to procedures, politics, billing, and treatment. We each from our disciplines share different views of these silos. Who's in charge of that silo, especially in that 4% of the, of the uh, super sick uh, patient? A word about the internet. The internet is an integrated collaborative network. It's my observation that even in Phoenix, the trauma programs are not integrated. They are competitive for economic reasons, just as they are in most states around, or most cities around the country. Integrated collaborative network in the, in the uh, internet is an example of how it can work, especially as we work together. So integrating these areas and where we can help each other, where we can interfere with each other, is a part of the rest of my talk. I'm trying to make this. Um, there's some special issues about resuscitation. Families don't belong there. Families visiting hours are everywhere across the map. I think they ought to be about 30 minutes three times a, way, a day. Only the patient's single doctor ought to write orders, not a team. There should not be standing and implied or protocol orders. Who requests and pays for consultation, and what is the determined end game? It's all about outcomes. We don't measure outcomes in our uh, quality review program in the hospital. We, we measure throughput and processes. Is the train running, not does the train stop? And the individuals that ch check that out are deformed. They are tight-lipped, furrowed-browed, pinafore-wearing, clipboard-carrying, uh, uh, anal-retentive, and sexually deprived, <laughs> looking for not outcome, but ways to throw stones uh, at you. Uh, the, these outcomes uh, have to do with improvement, uh, not uh, where to point blame. How can EMS, emergency medicine, and critical care help and hinder the surgical team? And that's what this talk is all about. We can abandon old stuff. Here is a smoke tobacco enema device from 1750 to 1810. It's now been taken off the market. Down at the bottom it reads, the tobacco enema was used to infuse tobacco smoke into the patient's rectum in order to make them breathe better. The warmth of the smoke was thought to promote respiration, but doubts of its credibility of tobacco enemas led to the popular phrase, blowing smoke up one's ass. <laughs> Don't laugh. You use a bunch of stuff just as bad as this, called a sphygmomanometer, <laughs> subxiphoid pericardiotomy, pericardiosynthesis, ultrasound, CT scan, helicopters, and on and on. What does a surgeon want to know from emergency medicine and from EMS? They want to know, honestly, is a patient dead? Dead peoples tend to remain dead, and no amount of coaxing or lab tests or ultrasound or chest tubes will cause them to, uh, to live. Probably we need to know, can the person talk? And can they move? Uh, do they have a peripheral pulse? Uh, we've learned that from the military. And that is much more valuable than uh, any sphygmomanometer, which about three-fourths of the time is incorrect. Sphygmomanometer ought to join the mass pants in the curiosity section of the medical museum. I've already talked about family pre uh, uh, presence. IV sites. Even in hypotensive patients, in the emergency room and in the ambulance should be nowhere. Nowhere. There is no value in an IV in the ambulance and in the emergency room in any patient who has a peripheral pulse. It can be started in the operating room and then appropriate fluids uh, administered. What fluids should be given? Uh, probably blood, plasma, platelets. I, that's all I can think of that might be beneficial. 
What medication? Uh, maybe some pain medicine. Where to go with the patient? The patient that we're talking about, the big bad code three, that 4%, probably need to go from the ambulance doc to the operating room or the I sur surgical ICU. The purpose of the emergency room in this patient that we exist for is to wave to the patient as they go from the ambulance doc to the operating room. Anything else in the emergency room adds time and there's nothing that you can accomplish there that doesn't make the patient worse. Any procedures? Well, uh, the procedures uh, now have become a, a real turf battle. Who does what procedure? Who tubes? Who puts in the chest tube? Who has authority? Probably, who does the subxiphoid pericardiotomy? In this month's Journal of Trauma that's just coming out, where's the person that gave that last talk? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, in this month's Journal of Trauma, it's suggested that this procedure be taken outside the hospital and be performed <laughs> by paramedics. Wait for that one to come out with a big editorial. I know it's there because I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> what about time? The golden hour is a hoax. Uh, it's a principle. It's never been studied. What hinders the trauma team or the acute care surgery team in the emergency room and in the ambulance? Mass pants are absolute instruments of the devil. They increase complication, death, it's not a good spent. And in 2012, probably the mo only indication I know of mass pants is in the postmenopausal man who has the inability to maintain an erection. <laughs> Blood pressure is absolutely the worst thing in correlating as an endpoint of our uh, treatment. Resuscitation should be uh, removed from our uh, uh, vernacular, and uh, blood pressure sphygmomanometer is, 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 is not a benefit at all. If it were, I would want my patients to be maintained at a blood, mean blood pressure of 50. And I have a lot of data from the cardiac literature and now the trauma literature that supports that. Large bore IV lines now finally have been removed from the ATLS course uh, as the people who weren't getting much blood to their brain were removed from that uh, committee finally. IV lines in the anacubital fossa, of course in the ambulance and in the emergency room it's a hindrance. Most of those infiltrate. The volume of any crystalloid, I would now say more than 25 cc's is a hindrance. Use of helicopters versus ground ambulance. There is only one paper out of 800 that show any survival advantage to air ambulance in the United States, Europe, and around the world, except for the military zone. Air ambulance has increased time, increased death, increased cost, increased risk of EMS accident, and decreased organ recovery. I think they ought to join the mass pants and the blood pressure cuff in that curiosity section. Elevation of the blood pressure in that big bad patient pops the clot and makes them worse. There are concerns about diluting volume, clotting factors, cytokines, popping the clot, and creating new injuries. And all of our resuscitations for the last 30 years have been designed to elevate that blood pressure. Why? Because we could not read a bird in the hand. We could not count the number of F's. We were blinded to the data that was there because of the strong personalities that put a protocol in place with absolutely no data in human beings. Needle decompression of anything, chest, belly, pericardium, brain, has not been shown to have a survival advantage. I can show you a number of patients who died because of needle decompression of the chest or the pericardium, or attempted, and, and many of those hit the heart, not the pericardium. Uh, airways, uh, 
uh, when it was not really indicated. Innumerable paramedics, innumerable emergency physicians have this retaliatory intubation on individuals who are difficult to manage rather than giving them a little bit of sedation. Interosseous infusions of anything is probably cruel and unusual uh, child abuse and adult abuse. I know of no indication to give interosseous anything except in the maybe child who has status epilepticus, maybe, and that data is very soft. The use of drugs in the ambulance in the emergency room except for pain medicine, anti-seizure is maybe uh, not indicated. Vasopressors, steroids, antibiotics, anticoagulants in the EMS and in the emergency department probably have no place whatsoever unless one is Addisonian. Cervical collars are put on everything. Cervical collars probably contribute to the internal decapitation and need tight uh, reanalysis. Cervical collars in penetrating trauma have no value whatsoever. And stuff put into open wounds except a routine dressing has not been shown to be uh, beneficial. Blood drawn in the field for emergency center work, we never use it. Lab panels in general, CBC, metabolic panel, clotting, drug alcohol, they really don't alter your deci our decision making. And they probably hinder. And they cost about $1,200, like the helicopter, it, it, doesn't help, it doesn't help us. What does help us? Information. IV site in the hand if you're really going to start an IV. Crystalloid volumes less than 25 cc's. Backboards help move patients. Estimated blood loss. Changes during transport. Is there a peripheral pulse? And what is the mental status? Those are helpful. If there's a deformity noticed, pressure dressings are helpful. And then there are some areas that are neutral. Oxygen is, still needs to be studied. Tourniquets in civilian practice using the military tourniquet uh, has, needs to be studied. Uh, disaster confusions uh, exist. And I'll really, because of time, not go into the disaster part of this talk. We have learned a lot from the various wars. And we now know that damage control hypotensive resuscitation, one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, and uh, rapid transportation uh, for critical care is beneficial. Putting it all together, emergency care is complex. Networking is possible. It can and should be standardized. In EMS and emergency medicine and critical care, it is not. There needs to be quality closure of loop analysis looking at uh, outcomes with evidence-based support. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is 97% of what I've said to you today is absolute true. Some 2.7% was said merely for effect. You don't know which twin is which. So, putting this all together, we live in this world together. We have a necessity to have an integrated collaborative network and work together and to recognize what we see in front of us is what should drive our future. The driver of this train for what we're talking about in acute care surgery and in the trauma patient is us. Thank you for letting me share with you my biases.